joining with computer audio. I am using the audio. Yes, I am. And I'm going to see the waiting room. And I'm admitting everybody. Admit everyone. All right, good boy. Good evening, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, boys and women. Good God, I need a haircut. Um, okay, cool. So tonight we're starting with Mammals to Part 1. Mammals is a four-part session, but we'll be doing one and two this week and three and four in the future in a few weeks' time because it's quite technical, so we'll get into some technical stuff when we've done some groundwork for it. So we're going to just do some basics. As always, I like to introduce where the species came from in a very basic crash course. We're doing 10 years of studies in 40 minutes, so this is a very much abbreviated. So if you guys have questions, you know the story, save it for Q&A on, on Saturday night. If you have any pressing questions, you can ask me beforehand though. Let's go to share screen and away. Oh yeah, I've got more people joining the party, admitting more. And from the beginning. Okay, cool. So tonight is the evolution of mammals. It's part one of mammals of the series. And before we get started to that, as usual, we're doing the book of the week or book one of the week. It's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. I've had this book for about 17 years now. So I suggest you go and buy it. It's absolutely brilliant, well written, very humorous, um, very easy reading. Um, in no way is a boring schlog and just it's an every man's guide to the history of the universe. Thoroughly entertaining, and I just admit, um, I just reckon that everybody should do, this, do themselves a favor and buy this book. So, um, you can get an audible as well. The audiobook, I actually have it on an audiobook, and I listen to my, my car at least, at least twice a year. So, fantastic to have. Okay, so going back to last time, we talked about the birds last week, and we're going to do some basic differences between birds and mammals again, just a recap. Um, obviously beyond feathers, mammals don't have feathers. One of the big differences in terms of their skeletal structure is that birds have one occipital condyle at the back of their skull, we have two. Um, another big difference is that reptiles and birds have multiple jaw bones fused together. They can be separated like a jigsaw puzzle, whereas mammals have one solid hard jaw. Okay, fine. Another big difference is that birds and mammals have different types of ear bones. Birds and reptiles have one ear bone, mammals have three ear bones. Okay, and again, oh, people are arriving late. The entire process took actually between 300 to 230 million years ago, uh, and three major extinction events, the Triassic, the Cretaceous extinction, we did that last time, you should know about that, we're not recapping it. And the Pleistocene extinction, which is still kind of ongoing in many ways. All right, going back to our favorite half amphibian, half reptilian animals that were living on the coastlines, the Cactohynids uh, occurred roughly 300 to 255 million years ago. And they were the ancestors of all advanced terrestrial vertebrates except for amphibians. So we don't count uh, amphibians as advanced vertebrates, they're pretty primitive. So. And going back to where we were last time. So last time we started off with the cotylosaurs or the captohynids, and we looked at the thecodonts, which became the crocodiles and the dinosaurs and the birds. But this time we're going right, and we're looking at the pelicosaurs. Okay, these big cell fin buggers over here. Um, they are not dinosaurs. You know, a lot of them get them. We get them with dinosaurs going way back, but really they are not dinosaurs in any. Way. They occurred probably around 100 million years before dinosaurs ever existed. In fact, dinosaurs are close to now than the pelicosaurs. Okay, so going back to captohynids or cotylosaurs, these were primitive reptiles loosely related to ancient amphibians. Most went extinct during the permanent extinction around 250 million years ago. And every terrestrial vertebrate, including you and me, except amphibians, is descended from them. They include all mammals, including us. And going from the Cactohynid, we're not going through all the fossil remains because we haven't got time for that, but over 50 million years, they gradually evolved into a variety of forms. The earlier Cactohynids, as you can see, um, were almost indistinguishable from the synapsids. The synapsids were these reptiles over here, but they were different to other reptiles. They had a few key features. One of the big key features is that they had a hollow socket, which we still have to this day, 
behind the R. Okay, sorry, getting people arriving a little bit late, admitting all. Okay, and that socket was a fantastic development. Also, you can see the solid fuse bone as opposed to where other reptiles had multiple drill bones. These guys had one solid fuse bone. What's interesting though, if you look at the jaw though, it's almost indistinguishable in terms of shape from reptilian where you have one jaw resting, you have the jaw resting on top of the skull as opposed to socketing into the skull, which is very reptilian in its shape. But the solid fuse jaw and that hollow socket behind the eye have very, very similar features to modern mammals. Now, synapsids had those hollow sockets which did a few things. They made the skull lighter without sacrificing strength. They saved energy by using less bones or less bone. And they provide an attachment point for the jaw muscles. So we started seeing the development of chewing rather than ripping. If you look at the crocodilians and the birds and the dinosaurs, they had very poor chewing functions. Um, tortoises get around this and turtles get around this by having beaks. But um, birds, sorry, uh, the synapsids had these really strong chewing muscles, which allow for chewing rather than ripping. And these guys first appeared in the fossil records around 320 million years ago. That's about 160 million years before the dinosaurs. And early synapses were not very different from the ancestors of the Caftahanids. They were almost indistinguishable, as you can see these guys over here at the bottom. Very similar in appearance. In fact, what is what, whether it's a synapsid or a Caftahanid, it's really purely academic. They were almost indistinguishable. It's like, what's the difference between a frog and a toad? Okay. So gradually over time, over millions and millions and millions of years, sinuses gradually diversified, diversified to various habitats. They grew larger and varied in shape, filling for full different ecological roles and having different diets. And around 300 million years ago, the first pelicosaurs began to appear. And they were very different to other reptiles at the time. They were covered in these bony deposits. So instead of having these scales that overlap each other, like snakes that like we know today, or like other reptiles, they had these bony little ridges, these little dots that covered their bodies. Very similar in shape to actually the way that our hairs are built today. Our hairs are come in rows very neatly um, and are interspersed with each other. And these bony deposits, osteoderms, as we call them, um, share a lot of the same sort of physiological features as modern hairs, and we assume based on all the fossil evidence, this is where hairs actually evolved from, from originally being protection to becoming warmth. And many later forms grew large cells in their back. Okay, this would have helped with um, displaying for obviously for mating purposes and also for just for thermoregulation. And one of the th key interesting things is that they had skin glands. And if you remember reptiles and birds, they don't have skin glands. Mammals do have skin glands. We sweat, we smell bad. We have the stuff coming out of our skin. We get oil, we get pimples. We have breasts, um, we have skin glands. And looking at the gaps and the partitions in this fossilized bony deposits, scientists assume, because you can't fossilize glands, that it doesn't have fossilized, that these ancient reptiles probably would have had very primitive skin glands. And this mm. is where the very okay. first right. would have evolved from. Okay. And they probably would have been pheromonal, they probably would have been the scent displays, um, or possibly skin protection, but we don't know because we weren't around 320 million years ago. We make assumptions based on the evidence, but it's still assumptions. The sail pelicosaurs were rather large, some of them were the size of the but the fins were drastically bigger. The Dimetrodons um, were the largest uh, genus. And they came in many shapes and many sizes, and most of them were hardened carnivores, but they were basing on the dental structures, some uh, omnivorous or possibly herbivorous species. Over time, these guys became extremely varied again, and due to the age of the fossils, exact classification of which family is which is fairly challenging. I've got a chat message over here. Um, we're gonna do that in the, um, the Cubit, who Ashley Cubit. We're going to do that in the Q&A on Saturday. But just to recap, um, we don't obviously know 100% because we don't, we don't have the bone remains, but assumptions were partly for display and also partly for, for thermal regulation. Like this pedestal is completely unrelated to have those plates on his back, probably for thermal regulation and warming themselves up. Um, but we don't know 100%. We assume based on the evidence. Okay. All right, due to the age of the fossils, extreme exact classification is challenging. It's 320 million years ago. There's, the fossils are destroyed by so much um, 
tectonic action, so much plate action, so many other fossils on top of them, very poor erosion or very good erosion. Look at it. Um, and to finding very well preserved fossils is quite challenging. And the smaller ones were almost never preserved. It's the bigger ones that were preserved very well. Um, and they formed a range of suborders. And the only one order is still around today, the cynodonts, literally the dog teeth. I've got a question there, I can't think again. Um, okay, yeah, guys, please turn off your sound if you're using the microphones, put them on mute, uh, just so that people can hear me talking because people are playing music in the background, apparently. Okay. So, emitting all. Okay, so these were the dominant land predators. Now remember, this was a long time before the dinosaurs, 100 million years before the dinosaurs. So they weren't dinosaurs. They weren't even related to dinosaurs. Um, they were the dominant land predators during the Triassic era, and they were only later replaced by the archosaurs. These were ancient crocodilians. We did that last class towards the early Jurassic. And this is what a therapsid would look like. Um, pretty intimidating. This guy's about the size of a lion to give you an idea. And you can see some key features that are quite mammalian in function, okay? A highly modified jaw and skull structure, which is distinct from reptiles. Reptiles tend to have a very cylindrical, very neat skull and jaw. Mammals tend to have more ridges and grooves and areas for muscle to grip on. We start to see specialized teeth. We also start to see a change in the gait. The, the, the bone structure is quite different. These are a lot of these features popping up. Also highly modified frontal limbs, or just limbs in general. Okay, so the first true therapsids, which were modified pelicosaurs, they lost their, fat, their cells in their back. They became more streamlined. And they had a distinct skeletal structure from uh, very similar to modern mammals, unlike pelicosaurs. So they, uh, their limbs were based under the body rather than alongside them. So lizards, crocodiles, they have limbs sticking out from the side. The therapsids, like modern rat mammals, have limbs under the body, okay, which allow for more streamlined movement, more expedience and speed, and more agility as well. They laid eggs, except they weren't calcium coated. They were papery type legs. And because they're papery type legs, very, very few eggs actually preserved in the fossil record. We do have some, but very few and far between. There's not many records of the eggs. And earlier forms still had scales like reptiles, but the more modern forms were starting to show fossilized hair. So somewhere between those osteoderms, those bony scutes on the skin, and somewhere between the hair that we have today, something in between, like ancient birds had scales and feathers together. And again, the jaws showed a significant increase in size and strength, um, indicating also with the muscular appendages that would have been attached, that they would have been uh, far more adept at chewing and biting and grabbing rather than just the snapping action that reptiles have. Okay, we've got lots of people joining late. And later fossils show signs of filamentous hairs, of modern hair. So to give you guys a recap of where we were, the Reptiles separated a long time ago, around 290 million years ago. The synapsids are these guys over here. They broke off into the pelicosaurs with their long scales. Gradually, they became the therapsids. The therapsids diversified into a variety of groups. And the cynodonts, which are what we're we'll coming to now, are still semi-reptilian, but quite mammalian in their shape and their bone structure and a lot of their features. So this is what some of the original therapsids would have looked like. You can see something between a mammal and a reptile. Again, this is uh, Oss's artist's interpretation. We obviously don't know the colors, but uh, we do know they had scales and scutes, um, osteoderms, and some later forms had hair. They also begin, because of their dental structures, we, we show that they occupied a variety of the different feeding methods. And because they would have occurred, the later forms would have occurred at the same time as the dinosaurs, they probably would have competed with dinosaurs as well. And Therese's jaws were far stronger than all other reptiles' uh, jaws at the time. And their teeth, here's the interesting thing, unlike other reptiles, were specialized in three basic forms. They had incisors for nipping and shearing. They had canines for puncturing and tearing. And they had molars for grinding and chopping. We still see these features in all modern mammals to greater or lesser degrees. But these are where the teeth functions first started to appear around 260 odd million years ago. You can see this Therese fossil over here. 
You can see the modified frontal incisors. You can see the canines over here. This almost looks like a cat skull in many ways, but it's not, it's a reptilian skull. And you can see the molar is very poorly preserved at the back of the mouth over there. And again, you can see molars, canines, and incisors. You can see the socket at the back of the skull, which we still have, which our jaw is still gripped to. Ours are not very developed, but our cats and dogs are very developed. Um, and again, a lot of that very elongated, very stylized shell scaping, um, skull shaping, which is more indicative of mammalian shape rather than that very cylindrical reptilian shape, more specialized for function. Now, what's amazing about South Africa, to brag to you if you're in the tourism industry, um, is that South Africa is some of the highest density of therapsid fossils in the world, in the Karoo. The crew is just literally crawling with therapsid fossils. Anything from the size of your hand, right to the size of a tiger. And farmers come up across these things all the time, and they just think they're fossils of various animals, but they're ancient. They are ancient, over 200 million years old. So we are really spoiled for choice in South Africa in terms of therapy. And most of our therapy research actually comes from South Africa. When I say South Africa, I mean Southern Africa, particularly the Karoo. Now the cynodonts were becoming increasingly more mammalian as we determine what a mammal is today. We obviously don't know if it was endothermic because there's no way to test the biological function of a fossil. But we do know that they had hair. We do know they had a lot of the bone structures that modern mammals had, but they still were fairly reptilian in many ways. And they first started appearing around 270 million years ago, the very, very early ones. And the word cynodont literally means dog tooth. That means it's the first fossils that were discovered. Scientists said that, well, the tooth looks kind of like a dog's tooth. So call the dog tooth. Scientists aren't very creative. So they shared numerous skeletal similarities with modern mammals. And the teeth were fully differentiated. I mean, completely different, all specialized here. Molars, premolars, incisors, and canines. Unlike uh, reptiles, which are just teeth. Snakes obviously have specialized piercing fangs, but they're the exception to the rest of reptiles. And the brain case bulged at the back of the head. Now remember, reptiles tend to have a very small brain case. Mammals have a very elongated brain case that sticks out from the back of the skull. Whether you're a cat, a dog, an elephant, a person, a porpoise, your brain is actually fairly developed, and these guys had fairly large brain cases as well. This is Bionothorium uaniensis. Uaniensis, yes, that's how you say it. Uh, and you can see frontal pointing eyes, binocular eyes. He was obviously some sort of ecological equivalent of a rodent because he had these incisors. He was not a rodent. Um, he was also tiny, again, only about the size of your hand. And um, he would have had these incisors, these molars, the canines had disappeared over time, but these strong tree muscles, you can see that at uh, socket below the eye, which is specialized where the jaws were attached to, the two occipital condyles at the back. And again, that really, really long elongated skull, which showed increased brain capacity. And increased brain capacity is usually a sign of endothermic reactions. Warm-blooded animals tend to be more intelligent than cold-blooded animals, because running a brain is expensive, and your, brain needs, your blood needs to be warm in order to do it. Okay? Cold-blooded animals tend to have far more simple brains. So we can probably assume, based on the fossil evidence, that he was warm-blooded. Again, we don't know. We just look at the evidence. <laughs> This is what he would look like. He was a small little guy. He was, again, quite tiny, not more than 15 centimeters long. And he would have probably been something that behaved very similar to a rodent or to a mole or a mole rat. Um, again, the ecological behavior, we're not sure, but looking at his dentition and his size, in all likelihood, he, was, he behaved the same as a rodent. Now, the therapists had a hard time when the dinosaurs came into power during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. This was the time of the big dinosaurs, which we did last time. And the therapists just realized they were losing the war. And over time, they gradually evolved to smaller and smaller and smaller forms. And remember, evolution is not a choice. It's just that you're selected. If you're a bigger therapist, you get eaten by a bigger dinosaur. If you're a smaller therapist, you tend to survive and run away and get into a hole. So over time, the smaller and smaller ones get naturally selected and they become smaller. They don't choose to become smaller. It's just pressures, ecological pressures, push them to become smaller. Okay. Um, many retained a short squat form that would indicate a burrowing lifestyle. They probably would have been very similar to dusties and voles and moles and rodents in terms of their lifestyles. And it's highly likely they would have been endothermic, as I said before, but there's no evidence beyond the, the physical evidence that we see based on the shape of the body and the cranium. 
Okay, now memory glands. Memory glands are really interesting. If you're a mammal, you have memory glands. Okay, all girls and guys have them. Okay, with men, ours usually don't work. So memory glands, including ours, are essentially highly modified exocrine glands. Now, exocrine glands are unique to mammals. They are sweat, oil, mucus, and pheromone glands. Okay, so if your body's producing pimples, sweat, oil out of your head, my head's quite shiny at the moment, you can see it's producing oil. Uh, if you smell musky, it's pheromones. Okay, all those things that turn girls and boys on, that's all pheromones. Those are all exocrine glands. Endocrine glands are inside your body and they pump your body full of hormones. So the exocrine glands are pumping pheromones and sweat and mucus. And again, we assume the therapists and the um, cyanodons had these based on evidence of their skin remains, of the fossilized skin remains. And soft tissue almost never preserves in fossils. However, mammary glands may have evolved off young suckling sweat and mucus and oil glands off their mothers for additional nutrients. Now, this sounds gross, but a lot of animals still do this. You often find um, mothers... Um, you know, not wasting any of the nutrients. They'll lick up the mucus of their, of their young. Mothers will do it with their mothers. Uh, you often see, sorry, not, uh, pups will do it with their mothers. You often see um, cats licking sweat off each other or uh, licking saliva off each other's faces. You often see um, uh, gorillas, for instance, wiping their brows to get the salt off it and so they can eat it with their food because they don't want to lose the salt. So this is still a very common behavior. And over time, the, uh, the ingestion of mucus and, and oils of the mother's body may have gradually evolved this way, like this. So we have mucus glands, the lysozine glands, which have just covered the body. Over time, areas that produce more and more mucus. Remember, milk is a mucus, so you're drinking mucus when you drink milk. So it's not the stuff that just necessarily comes out of your nose. Okay, so over time, these mucus glands would have become more and more, more developed. And eventually, they would have become lactating mammary glands, becoming highly specialized mucus glands. Okay, so we can start to see some high diversification over here. And this was a hypothesis for how mammary glands would have evolved. But in all intents and purposes, there's no difference between a breast and a pimple in terms of, in terms of basic functions, or in terms of a breast or an oil gland. They're the same thing. They're exocrine glands. They do the same things. They're built the same way. They develop the same way. Okay, so to recap, we talked about the ancient reptiles a long time, uh, long time ago, the cotylosaurs that broke into two groups. Last week we did the thecodonts, they became the dinosaurs, uh, which became crocodiles and birds. We haven't done lizards and snakes and tuataras yet, that's another day. Um, we're looking specifically now at the pelicosaurs, and um, we haven't done turtles, which are on this little road over here. So we're not doing turtles today either. So the pelicosaurs became therapsids, and the therapsids, which is now extinct for a very long time, became the mammals. And that all happened over the last 280, 300 million years. The first mammals started to appear around 170 million years ago. We'll get there now. So the end of the therapsids. Towards the end of the Jurassic era, 160 million years ago, large therapsids started disappearing from the fossil records. Smaller, more delicate mammalia forms, reptiles, became increasingly more common in the fossils. Many true mammals started appearing in the fossil records around 100 million years ago. So what we would say, this is a mammal, as in categorically, physiologically, a mammal. They started appearing around 100 million years ago. Now, the first mammals that started to appear were the monotremes. These guys today are only found in Australia, but they were also historically occurred in parts of Asia. So modern mammals um, are these little boikies at the top. We get placentals, marsupials, and monotremes. And the monotremes were, are the oldest group. They separated from the rest of the ma uh, mammalian forms around 150, 160 million years ago, possibly even earlier than that. Okay, And they're very different to marsupials and placentals. They have been separated for well over 100 million years ago. Bear in mind, the dinosaurs only came around 140 million years ago. So these guys were around before the dinosaurs. And monotremes are the most primitive of mammals. Through genetic studies we show, um, through molecular clocks, which we'll get discussed in another lesson, is that ancient monotremes possibly evolved around 200 million years ago. To give you an idea of what a molecular clock is, it's, we look at the ATCG cycles in DNA, uh, that's a whole other story, and we look at the rate of muta mutation per generation. And if you don't understand this, this is fine. If you do understand this, this is great. 
and they reverse the rate of mutation per generation and they work out at what point these two species must have separated and they are usually about 80 to 95 percent correct they're never terribly inaccurate and they're never 100 percent accurate but you're usually getting about 80 to 90 percent accuracy for example we did the molecular clock test between humans and chimpanzees and we threw the molecular clock test which shows that we separated around six million years ago Coincidentally, our fossils line up and show that our fossils separated around six million years ago. So the molecular test and the fossil test line up with each other. But we'll get into details of that in another story. But genetic molecular class is something that we use to work out rates of mutation per generation and work it back. So although we can work out through molecular clocks that monitoring is probably, probably appeared around 200 million years ago, the actual fossil evidence of the first monitoring found uh, were 110 million years ago. And this is a big gap, but bear in mind that monotremes are tiny and small fossils almost never preserve. To give you an idea of how few fossils preserve, they reckon that only between one in seven billion and one in 10 billion bones preserve in a fossil. So in order to have one human fossil today, the entire human population would have to be would have to die and you maybe find out of that entire human population one fossil so uh so again we, you don't find many fossils um and so the sheer number of fossils just shows how much they must have occurred at or how many of them actually occurred in those times they must have been in the hundreds of millions hundreds of billions um over millions of years so when we're not finding fossils it doesn't mean they didn't occur there it means that that uh, there's just no evidence for them but we can obviously interpret from out of the science but with first conclusive evidence we have of monotremes is around 110 million years ago today there's around only around five monotremes alive the monotremes include ductal platypuses and echidnas or spiny anteaters and what's really interesting about ductal, platyp ductal platypuses is that the males have spurs containing venom Echidnas or spiny anteaters also have spurs, but they don't have any venom, which is really interesting. So now the fossils of extinct species also show a prevalence for spurs, indicating that venom may have been common in early monotremes. So all the, the fossils of these extinct species have spurs, and the spurs have no function beyond having venom. So they reckon that ancient species probably all were venomous to greater or less extents. And that's just something really interesting. Again, just purely coincidental evidence and we interpret it, but all monotremes, including the fossils, had spurs. Now monotremes are egg-laying mammals, but the, they nurse the hatchlings with milk. So this was the oldest piece of fossil that we found, Strepopodon, and it's a fossil dating back to 110 million years ago. It, was, it is the jawbone of an animal that has, is almost identical to a modern marsupial, I mean, to, I'm sorry, modern um, monotreme, modern platypus. And they, to the average layman, if you were studying bones, you would say this is a platypus uh, jawbone. But it is slightly different, showing that, that it would have been a slightly different animal. Obviously, the physical, the rest of the body we don't know about, but we have this one piece of bone dating back 110 million years. If you're not a specialist in bones, you would just say that's just a bone of some animal, but obviously bone specialists are able to tell you exactly what animal it belongs to. Any zoologist will be able to tell you this. Okay, now they are egg-laying animals. And they lay these calcium coated shell, very similar to a bird shell. And they either lay in a nest or they carry in the pouches. So the chidinus, spiny anteaters lay in their pouch, whereas ductal platypuses actually lay nests. They build a little nest and they burrow it into the ground and they, and they incubate their nest like a bird. Surreal, but true. They also have mammary glands. So this is a ductal platypus female in her nest nursing her young. Very cute. They're not much to look at. She's not very smart though. Um, so what you'll learn about the um, monotremes is that they actually have very underdeveloped brains compared to modern mammals. And they're actually pretty primitive in terms of their intelligence. They're not much more intelligent than a reptile. They have, they're purely responsive. And now we get into the, the Therians. Now the Therians are a group of mammals that first started to appear around 100 million years ago. They're more of what you consider your conventional mammals. This over here, by the way, is a distribution chart showing the various mammals around the world. So monotremes were the oldest. They first started to appear around Asia and Australia around 200, 200 million years ago. Uh, gradually they broke off into two groups, uh, mon uh, marsupials, which disappeared into Australia and the Americas. Around 105 million years ago, we started seeing 
placental mammals appearing and gradually expanding into all the various waves of mammals that we know today throughout the world. So although these two groups are fairly uh, simple, the monotremes and marsupials, placentals are extremely varied. Okay, now therians are assumed to have given birth to live young as all their modern relatives do. Whether you're a placental or a marsupial, you give birth to live young. So the first therians were small rodent-like creatures. They were kind of between, somewhere between a, a marsupial and a placental. They were just these small little rat-like things. They weren't rodents though. They looked like rodents, but they weren't. So modern marsupials, sorry, modern uh, therians are divided into placentals and marsupials. Now, we're talking about marsupials today. We'll do placentals next time. Modern marsupials first started to appear around 125 million years ago. This was the time of the dinosaurs. They were small little things. Uh, they would have been arboreal. They were very rat-like in their shape, but they were very different. Ancestral species were found throughout North America, Asia, and Australasia. And today's marsupials are only found in North and South America, sorry, North and South America, as well as Australia. The oldest marsupial fossil that we found uh, as a modern marsupial uh, was Sonodelphus, and we have a lot of records of them coming back around 110 million years ago. Okay, this was the best preserved specimen that they found, and this is a reconstruction based on the fossil over there. And if you're not a specialist in mammals, you'll say, why is it different to, from a rat? But if you're a specialist in, in mammals, you'll be able to tell straight away from the bone structures that it's a marsupial. Um, I take it for granted because I don't work for BBC. Okay, so Sinodelphus was the first marsupial. It was a small rodent-like structure, little creature. It lived in trees based on its shape. And modern marsupials all have an abdominal pouch called a marsupium, where they rear the young for an extended period of time. I've heard this rumor going around among some guards working in the crew that they're saying that um, springboks are marsupials. It's absolute nonsense. I know springboks have a pouch near their anus, but they're not marsupials. They don't carry their young in their pouches. Springboks are antelopes. They are related to all the antelope. Okay, they're specifically gazelles, but they're not marsupials. Uh, I know some people have told me this, but if you've heard it, it's absolute garbage. Okay, so marsupials have an abdominal pouch called a marsupium, where they rear their young for an extended period of time. They have a very underdeveloped yolk sac placenta. Again, yolk sac, because it's not that different from an egg. It just develops a yolk and a sac inside the uterus, and it, uh, they, they, they uh, go through a very quick gestation period, and um, they get birthed after a couple of weeks to a very underdeveloped, effectively, embryo with one little clawed hook on its hand. And you'll see over here, this is what they look like when they're born. This is a baby kangaroo when it's newborn, straight out of its mother. And it climbs up from the vagina, up to the pouch of the mother, climbs into the pouch and suckles for months on end until it grows bigger and bigger and bigger until it's a fully fledged joey. And then it's able to hop around next to the mother. But this is what they're born like, essentially an embryo. It's a more super pouch of an opossum from North America. And with the young, they're all born highly underdeveloped. They have to crawl into the pouch of the mother and nurse until fully grown. South America has around 103 species of opossums, different to possums. Opossums are from the Americas. North America has just one species, the Virginia possum. It's a big boy though. And Australia has around 250 species, a very diverse range of marsupials. So the American possums are all very similar. They're just opossums. They're very cute, look like rodents, but they have a pouch. Um, and they're fairly intelligent. Um, they do not carry rabies like everyone has the rumor has. Uh, and they're very important for controlling tick infestations and for controlling insects. And people have culled them in areas and because of this, insect populations have exploded. Now, Australian marsupials are very interesting. They're ecologically isolated, which means they experience massive radial evolution. There are no native placentals to Australia beyond bats and rodents. Some rodents obviously drifted across on logs millions of years ago. Bats have just flown across, but there are no placentals like cows or dogs or cats or anything like that on the island of Australia. Naturally, they've all been introduced by man. And that's why they're having such big competition with marsupials here. Marsupials range in size from mega browsers to stealthy predators, arboreal climbers, and rodent-like foragers. Many of the larger marsupials hunt, uh, were hunted to extinction by the Aboriginal hunter-gatherers around 50,000 years ago. So when the Aborigines arrived 50,000 years ago, they came in from Papua New Guinea, and the marsupials had never encountered 
humans or anything similar to humans in their lives and they just had no they had no chance and all the large marsupials were obliterated australia was ecologically very similar to to, to africa there were big predators there were big grazers big browsers most of them were wiped out of the 23 megafauna on the island megafauna being big animals uh, sorry the 24 23 were wiped out only the large kangaroos are left over now and there was the Tasmanian tiger. He was around until the 1930s. He was last eradicated in the 1930s. The last one died in the, in the zoo. So some Australian marsupials include the notoricic morphias, which are marsupial moles. In no way related to moles, just happen to be called marsupial moles. The Dacianomorphas, which are coniferous marsupials. And um, these guys are mostly insectivorous today. I'm sure you've heard of the Tasmanian devil, this little blighter down over here. Okay, Tasmanian tiger was also one of these guys, but again, he's gone extinct. The paramelomorphids uh, are the bilbies and the bandicoots, um, very similar to our little spring hars and um, look kind of like a rabbit in many respects, but very, very different. And the last are the diplodonta, which are wombats, koalas, kangaroos, and possums. Again, possums are very ecologically very similar in their behavior and their um, ecological role to our bush babies. Koalas are similar to our um, primates. Kangaroos are browsers and graders like our antelope. And the wombats, very similar to dussies and capybaras in, in Australia, I'm sorry, in South America. So, ancient, uh, some of the ancient um, marsupials that went extinct was Diprotodon, which was a marsupial wombat the size of a hippo. So he was about three meters long and weighed about three tons. Okay, and these guys occurred in great numbers until about 50,000 years ago and they were wiped out by the native Aborigines. The giant short faced kangaroo was about two to two and a half meters tall, also hunted to extinction, unfortunately, very recently. The marsupial lion went extinct. Um, we're actually very sure, not sure. We have them in the fossil records. We don't know when they went extinct because there's not many bone records. So we don't know if they were outcompeted by the Aborigines or they just disappeared before that. Uh, on a side note, the dingo is not a is not a wild animal in Australia. It is a domestic dog that was introduced to Australia around 50,000 years ago and it's become feral and just fitted in with their system. But they're not naturally part of the uh, Australian uh, fauna. And of course, the Tasmanian tiger that went extinct in the 1930s. Um, that was the last large marsupial carnivore. So we're going to end off tonight on marsupials. Tomorrow we're going on to con uh, not carnivores, onto placentals. We'll be discussing primates, humans. We'll be discussing all the various other types of predators, things that we know more about that fit more relatedly to South Africa. So I hope that you guys had some interesting um, bits of tidbits to learn. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask, ask me via WhatsApp or on the Q&A on Saturday night. We're going to end off that on that note for the evening. I thank you for joining me. Hopefully it wasn't too boring. I'm going to say Alfie Deshain. Adios. Arriva Deci. Bon voyage. Assalamu alaikum. Zaijian. Zainora. And so on and so forth. Adios. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's super interesting. All right, cool guys. All right, that's it. Peace out. Bye.